Hi everyone, welcome to week eight. And this week we are going to be switching gears again and going into another group of bacteria. So let me share my screen so I can have the PowerPoint visible for you guys here. Hang on one second. Get the PowerPoint up, there we go. So this week we are all about gram negative coxy. So completely different switch. We've covered grandpa's coxy, we've now covered grandpa's rods, and now we're covering gram-negative coxy. So specifically, we are gonna be discussing Neisseria and Meraxella cataralis in this chapter. These are very much fastidious organisms. So going back to the beginning, when we learned the word fastidious, we learned that that meant they were very picky. So in other words, these are not going to grow on blood agar. Blood agar is usually supportive for almost anything except phosphidias. So chocolate agar is gonna be the key to growing these beautiful organisms out. All right, so in general, like I said, they are gram-negative coxy, and actually they are gram-negative diplococci. So they do tend to occur in pairs. And those pairs are said to be kidney bean shaped in this case. Very much oxidase, positive. So this is the first time we're really using that oxidase test. You know, before when we were gram staining for the grandpa's coxy and grandpa's rods, we used catalase as our very next test after gram staining. Whenever we get gram negatives, we always oxidase test first. So a gram negative oxidase is the very first test we run. So we're looking for that oxidase enzyme that the bacteria will have. And Neisseria and Maxella cateralis definitely always are oxidase positive. So it's bolded there, it's a big feature of them. They also, besides just being pickier, wanting chocolate agar, wanting more specific agars, they like a, a more increased CO2 environment, so they're a little bit more capnophilic that way. Okay, so we're gonna start with Neisseria meningitidis. Neisseria meningitidis does exactly what it says in the name. It causes meningitis. It's one of the major pathogens that causes meningitis. Um, you usually will hear this called meningococcal disease. Um, it's, it, can, it does have a vaccine. I'm sorry, I'm stuttering over my words, I know. But it does have a vaccine that are given, especially to younger children and teenagers. This is the one that's at high risk for anybody that is living in close quarters with each other in their teens, so dorms. If you ever read about cases where an 18, 19 year old living in a dorm gets meningitis and dies, and there are cases out there. I mean, if you Google it, there's news articles all across the country where this happens. Um, it's typically Neisseria meningitidis that was the organism to blame. That is its prime target, kind of prime spot where we see it. Yeah, we talked about strep pneumoniae, which is a major cause of meningitis. That typically has a different group of um, people that it targets. Same with strep A. galactiae and listeria. Those targets more fetuses. So Neisseria meningitidis is typically um, children and teenagers, especially if they live in close quarters. So there is a vaccine that they highly recommend that it be given to everybody. My 12-year-old daughter has already had this vaccine because if you, why not protect yourself? Before I went to college, they never had that vaccine. I never got that, so thankfully I never had to worry about it. But typically, Neisseria meningitidis um, colonizes mucous membranes, and then of course it's spread person to person. Um, it's meningitis. Meningitis is very much spread person to person through respiratory kind of um, passing. So this is a picture of a chocolate agar plate growing Neisseria out. Neisseria in general look a lot like <laughs> a lot of other colonies, uh, a lot of other organisms. They're gray. Yay, like there's nothing really that fancy. Um, so you can see that they're nice and gray. There's not any hemolysis or anything here that we need to describe. And then of course our other big pathogen in the Neisseria group is Neisseria gonorrhea. Obviously it causes gonorrhea, which is very much an STD spread through sexual contact. It is never considered part of our normal flora. So it will of course cause infections in the genitalia, the rectum, and the throat, all through STD contact. It looks just like the Neisseria meningitis on the chocolate agar plate. And then finally, our third organism that you have to know out of this chapter is Moraxella cateralis. This is, again, still a gram neg diplococci. That's why these are all grouped together. Now, there are other Neisserias and other Moraxellas that we haven't discussed that are actually gram neg rods. 
Um, and they're very much not that prevalent. I don't think we even have them in a chapter. I used to could put them in a PowerPoint before, and then I think I removed those PowerPoint slides when, just because I didn't feel that they were necessary. So usually when we're talking about Neisseria and Moraxella that we're concerned about that are clinically significant, we are talking about the gram-negative diplococci ones. There, so again, if you ever hear of any that are gram negras, if you hear like a weird Moraxella or a Neisseria that you've never heard of, that's probably those ones that I just decided, they're not that prevalent, we're not gonna even mention them. Um, so, again, we are focusing just on these ones that are gramnic diplococci. Now, Moraxella cataralis is considered normal flora of the upper respiratory tract, and in fact, that's the area where it loves to cause infections. So, Moraxella cataralis is a huge um, pathogen with upper respiratory infections, URIs for short. So, lots of otitis media, which is ear infections. Sinusitis, pneumonia, which pneumonia is a little bit of a lower respiratory, but you can see it's all about the respiratory area and upper, especially the upper. Now, Moraxella is unique on agar when it grows. Yes, it's gray colonies, but it has what they call a hockey puck consistency, which means when you take your loop to go pick it up to work with it, it moves it across the agar. So just like a hockey puck would on ice, like when you take your loop, you can kind of push the colony across the agar plate, and that is extremely unique to Moraxella cataralla. Okay, so media, again, no growth on blood agar. These are fastidious organisms, so they will definitely grow on chocolate. They also have some specialized media. We have learned these. Let's revisit these. You still need to remember these, again, for upcoming tests because it ties into these organisms. So remember, modified Thayer Martin and Martin Lewis are amazing augers to also grow out in Nyseria. They are very similar. Um, the lab is typically going to only have one of these on hand. They are both chocolate-based augers with lots of antibiotics in them to ensure that only Nyseria grows if it's present. So inside the Thayer Martin is colistin, which inhibits gram negatives, vancomycin, which inhibits gram positives, Trimethoprim, which will inhibit Proteus, and Nystatin, which inhibits yeast. In the Martin Lewis, it still has colistin, it has higher amounts of vanco, it still has trimethoprim, and then it uses mycin to inhibit the yeast instead. You have to remember what's in these and what the, those antibiotics are specifically inhibiting. And then as far as testing goes, we already discussed that once we see it's a gram-negative coxy, we are going to, or oxidase test it, and it's always oxidase positive for these ones. And then with Nyserias, they, a lot of places, and now not everywhere, we all know that not everywhere does the same test, but you will read it a lot, you will see it on board questions here and there about the carbohydrate utilization, or in other words, sugar utilization. We can differentiate and separate Nyserias out based on what sugars they will use and which ones they won't use. So we have it all listed here. There is a third Neisseria that we listed called Neisseria lactamica. Um, it's very rarely a pathogen, but I wanted to list it so you can see how just between three different Neisserias, that carbohydrate utilization really differentiates between the three. So with Neisseria gonorrhea, it only utilizes glucose, and maltose, lactose, and actually you could add on a fourth column, sucrose are all negative. Neisseria meningitidis uses glucose and maltose, the rest are negative, and the Neisseria lactamica will use glucose, maltose, and lactose. And do you see the way that I've set this chart up? I put the initials together, so the Gs only go to the G, gonorrhea only goes out as far as the glucose, meningitidis goes out as far as the maltose to the M, M and M, and lactamica, just like it's called lactamica, goes out to the lactose. So I set it up that way, in my head it works perfectly for memorization, and I don't even have to think about it, I just can remember it this way. Now, Moraxella cataralis does not use any sugars at all. Um, that doesn't come into play with the carbohydrates, so if you do have Moraxella cataralis, that'll be negative on all the sugars. Instead, you can test for an enzyme called DNA. So Moraxella cataralis is very much DNA positive, whereas Neisserias are not, they're negative for DNA. So this Moraxella will have DNA. It's an enzyme that does what exactly it's named for. It breaks down DNA into smaller pieces. 
And so there is an auger called the DNA auger, which you see pictured here on the right, that you can kind of streak out the organisms. And so essentially, if the organism had the DNA enzyme, it will break down the DNA and produce a clear halo around it. So letter A there shows a really nice clearing, a nice clear halo. That would show a positive result. Whereas letter C did not have any halo, did not have DNA, so that would be a negative result for that organism. So again, Moraxa catarallis would be an example of letter A. It would very much be positive for DNA. This is just showing the oxidase test. Typically with the oxidase, and you guys will all get to perform oxidase testing in labs, so that'll help put that in perspective. Oxidase testing will turn a purple color when it's positive, so keep that in mind. Purple means positive for oxidase. So go into the oxidase testing with your lab instructors. Talk about the enzyme, what it's looking for, that kind of thing. Dig a little bit into the principle of oxidase testing. I encourage you to do that because you may have an oxidase question or two on an upcoming quiz or exam. And then, as always, we love to flowchart everything. So I added a flowchart. I found there's never a perfect flowchart out there. Every lab is a little bit different, but it shows you how at the top, overall Neisseria genre, it's gram negative. They typically are non-modal, um, same temperature and everything. If you go over to the Neisseria, you see it's gram negative coxy to be specific. It is oxidase positive. And then it discusses the main pathogens are, again, are gonorrhea and meningitis. This Neisseria weaveri, weaveri, I cannot pronounce it right. So this one that they see here that we haven't talked about, that's one of those gram neg rods that I mentioned. So again, there's other Neisseria that are gram neg rods. We don't care about those. They're not something we're going to talk about. They're not prevalently seen. We very much care about Neisseria gonorrhea and meningitis. So. so it's just kind of putting this into perspective. These other items on here that you see, Kingella, Iconella, these are going to be bacteria that are coming up that we will discuss eventually. So um, again, there's not a ton of testing you need to know here. The beautiful part is you've got three organisms only to know from this chapter and minimal testing results. So this hopefully chapter should be a breeze for you. Again, the biggest thing I would encourage you to do is dig a little bit into the principle of the oxidase test um, and then, yeah, just know the other test results we discussed and you should be just fine. So as always, reach out if you have any questions and have a fabulous week. Thanks, everybody.